So, sir, when I met you for the first time in 2014, I asked you this question inspired by Peter Thiel's zero to one. What important truth in investing do very few people agree with you on? And you replied at that point of time, paying up for quality. If I asked you the same question today, will you answer, will you answer me the same or it will change given how some of the quality companies are valued today by the market? So that's the interesting question. And you know, my answer is the same, by the way, very short answer to your question is the answer is not changed, but the context is important. So, um, so when we last talked about it and I have written about it, spoken about it, um, the basic idea was that there is this school of value investing called deep value investing, where you are spoiled by a wonderful teacher like Ben Graham. And his idea of investing was to invest in uh, businesses that have uh, have uh, you know stocks which are valued at below liquidation value in many cases or at extremely low multiples of their normal earning power and he wrote his book uh, coming out of the great depression you know 1934 was the first edition of his book security analysis and uh, he was he was very paranoid about protecting the downside risk and um, so I had, I had been teaching this subject for a long time and uh, in 2014 when we talked about uh, this subject, it had been almost three years and I had sort of transitioned over towards the other side of value investing, which is the Philip Fisher um, philosophy, which we all know is followed by so many investors around the world, including uh, Warren Buffett and Charlie Mango. So in that context, I said, uh, well, you should pay up for quality, but uh, the key thing here was that you are still a value investor, which means you don't want to overpay for anything. So uh, what I meant then, and I want, what I stand by what I said then was that, uh, that there are these businesses which have some unique characteristics and they should be distinguished from the ordinary business. The ordinary business uh, has no competitive advantage, has no pricing power, it tends to earn a mediocre or poor returns on capital over the long term. It has the, usually a, a levered balance sheet. Now, that doesn't mean that these businesses have no value. Uh, of course, it does have value. But the way to value such a business is not the way to value a high quality business. So that was the distinction that I was making when I said pay up for quality. Um, but, you know, since then, there is a new term that has been coined and it's called uh, buy at any price, B-A-A-P, and that's sort of ridiculous in my view, and I've talked about it in the recent past. I never bought into that idea of buying at any price. Paying up doesn't mean that uh, there is uh, no limit to the price that you will pay for an asset, because it's even ridiculous to even try to rationalize it. It's sort of mathematically foolish to even try to justify B-A-A-P, buy at any price. I mean, if you think about it, the total return on a stock that you own, that you buy today, and if you expect to hold it for like five years, seven years, 10 years, over your expected holding period, the total return will come from only four variables. And those four variables are the entry multiple of earnings, the growth in earnings that will occur over your uh, prospective holding period, the dividends that will come out of that, and the exit multiple. Because the exit multiple combined with the earnings 10 years out or five years out or seven years or whatever your holding period is to determine the exit stock price. So you will have the exit stock price compared to the current stock price that will give you the capital gains. And then you have the dividends which are there. So these are the only sources of, uh, of return that you will have. And, uh, and if you change just one variable, which is the entry variable, um, a, a, a entry multiple, uh, by jacking up the price, then you plug these numbers in an Excel model, then, you know, obviously, if you increase the entry price, the total return goes down because the total return, the other things, earnings growth, the dividends that will come out of those earnings that that will grow or the exit multiple are sort of independent of the entry price that you pay. pay. So the more you pay, the less the return that you will make. It's so obvious. It's so mathematically obvious, right? And if you keep increasing the price, at some point the return becomes zero. And if you do it, keep going, uh, then it becomes negative. And another way to think about it is in terms of margin of safety, right? We all know the idea of margin of safety, which is the difference between perceived value and 
and price paid for a stock. If you keep increasing the price paid, the margin of safety must come down and then it becomes zero because the value is independent of the price. The value of a stock is nothing to do with the price that you paid for it. So the more you pay for it, the less the money you should make and you can overpay for it and then you should lose money. And that's exactly the logic behind, uh, uh, you know, um, thinking about it in, the, in, the, in, in terms of mathematics. Now, the thing is that the concept of BAAP can, is like any other fad, you know, it can have, uh, uh, it can produce uh, extraordinary returns for a period of time and then people start thinking, well, this is the way to do it. And uh, it might have worked for a while, but it is not logical, right? It's not, it's not nothing to do with underlying value. So people who have paid very happy multiples for mature businesses, oh, I'm not talking about businesses that are going to grow and grow and grow like, you know, businesses, which are still in the very high growth stage, technique, uh, uh, theoretically, you can pay a high multiple of the current earnings because earnings are going to grow very rapidly, but there are a whole bunch of businesses in India, which are very valued, very highly, which are of excellent quality. No doubt. They have great, um, uh, business models. They have a wonderful. Uh, people who run those businesses in terms of their operating skills, the capital allocation skills and the integrity, but, but they're mature businesses, uh, which means that their future growth is not going to be anywhere close to the growth that they have seen in the past 20 or 30 years. These businesses have been around for a very long time, but they tend to get sold at very high prices. Maybe because there is scarcity value, maybe because governance is a concern here. I don't want to go into the reason why that has happened because that will try to justify what markets do. But the point I'm making is that if you are paying a high multiple for a very mature business of high quality, you will only make money if the multiple does not contract over time. And that's something which almost always happens. I mean, look at it, look at the world around you. Google, by the way, Alphabet is currently selling at a P of 20. As businesses become mature, their growth rates must come down and P multiples 10 years out, 15 years out must factor the growth beyond that period. So if forward growth rates will come down, which will always happen, then multiples must contract. And if you are paying ATP multiple for a business today, which will be valued at 2025, 20, maybe 30 P multiple 10 years out, then you're looking at a contraction of multiple from 80 to 30 over 10 years. Then the only way that can be offset for you to make money is to have earnings growth, which is so extraordinary that it more than offsets the, the, the reduction of return that will come because of the reduction of the multiple. And that's a very dumb assumption to make because we are, as, as I mentioned, if a business is mature, the earnings growth rate is not going to be extraordinary. If the earnings growth rate is not going to be extraordinary, then the forward multiple must be a normal multiple mid teens, maybe low twenties. Not more than that. Any model that assumes exit multiples many years out uh, for a mature business to be more than 20, 22, 23, maybe 25 max is something which I think is absurd and, uh, uh, and it's foolish assumption in my view. So again, going back to the point that you were asking, pay up for quality in, the, uh, by, uh, in comparison to deep value businesses, mediocre businesses, commodity businesses, businesses which have poor returns on capital, but don't make the mistake of paying up too much for a mature business because then you have a very high risk of having a permanent impairment of capital in the long run. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so if I got it correctly, uh, just to summarize, uh, you should pay up higher multiple only when you are sure of very high growth. If you don't, if you are looking for mature businesses, the paying up very high multiple exit multiple would be very, very, very difficult uh, as in would be a thing which, which will keep you in danger. Yeah. And that gets into the behavioral side, Ankit, because, you know, when people are paying, uh, high multiples, they are obviously very sure. They are sure. Obviously, obviously if they were not sure, they wouldn't do that. Right. So they are certain. The question is, um, how likely is it that they'll turn out to be right? So history tells us, if you look at, uh, base rates, if you look at the trajectory of growth rates of, of, of mature businesses, they all, they will always go down. There is a, again, that's a, almost a 
a law of mathematics growth rates will become normal typically a business cannot continue to grow more than the growth rate of the economy because if it, if you ex extrapolate it beyond a point up to a, uh, there comes a point time when the business becomes bigger than the economy and that's absurd right so it's almost like proof by contradiction that you can't project very high growth rates perpetually so uh, so growth rates will become normal but people who are paying a very high multiple they are when you said you know you should be sure of course he is sure the question is not if he is sure the question is the consequences of what will happen if you are wrong so you have to just think about that part that what if i am overconfident what if i go wrong okay i am sure i am sure about it fine but what if i was wrong what are the consequences so let's say there is a 10% chance of you being wrong a 10% chance of you being wrong could result in an 80% drawdown for you is it worth it so you even so you can, when you say sure what do you really mean by saying that you are sure are you 100% sure and if you are saying i am 100% sure about this well that itself is a problem because uh, there are no certainties in life so just mentally think about that okay i am very confident but what if i am wrong what if i am 10% wrong and what are the consequences? Just think through those consequences as to what happens when um, when you pay 80, 90 p multiple and the growth rate becomes negative. What happens to the stock? And when you plug that in, maybe you will be more sanguine about your own thinking about the future. Number one, number two, maybe you will ad, uh, adjust for uh, 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 this kind of thinking by changing the size of the position that you will put on that uh, on that particular. Uh, business in the portfolio and so on. So there are many ways of thinking about it, but the point is obviously the guy who is paying 80, 90 p multiple, he's cocksure about it. He or she is very, very sure about uh, the future growth rate. Otherwise, it just it doesn't make mathematical sense, right? If he's saying that there is no way earnings multiple will be 30 10 years from now. Yes, that is possible only if the earning growth rate of earnings is still 30, 35, 40 percent 10 years out. How likely is that? Obviously, the guy is very cocksure about it, but what if he was wrong? Let's just give a small chance of his being wrong and the consequences of that. So I think that's uh, the way to think about this. Thank you so much. Sir. So moving on to the next question. Uh, the next question is also related to what I noticed in your office when I met you. I don't know if you still have that Warren Buffett quote fixed in your office or not, but that was the first time I think I read it. Uh, the difference between successful people and very successful people <laughs> is that very successful people say no to almost everything. How have you used this quote in your investing and life? If you can share some examples, that would be great source of motivation for all. You know, I'll just uh, give a you know sort of warning about quotes. You know, you have to be very careful about using quotes and uh, you know not assuming that they are applicable in all you know facets of life. You know, context is very important here. I mean, there are situations where this quote is applicable and situations where it is not. Uh, like, imagine that I'm wearing the hat of a teacher uh, and students come to me and asking for help. I can't say no to most of them, right? I can't say no that uh, I have to say yes to only the request of a few of your students. Uh, I have to say yes to every one of them. So uh, context matters. There are there are contexts where this quote is hugely applicable, I think. Um, it certainly applies to time. I'll come to the investing part in a bit. It certainly applies to time because we have limited time, right? And that's, uh, you know, Seneca's essay on the shortness of life was so right and so applicable in the current world that we live in. So much distraction, you know, people are not focused. They just keep wasting their time. And then by the time they regret uh, about how much time they wasted on something, it's just too late. Um, now, I've tried to be careful with this thing. I think the quote is relevant in many contexts and one of the contexts in which is relevant is what time do you, how do you allocate your own time to what activity? Is it meaningful to you? Does it add value to you and to your uh, family members and so on? Um, so that was uh, about the applicability of uh, this particular quote in, uh, in things which have got nothing to do with investing. But when it comes to investing, then also, if you think about it, uh, this applies to investing in quality businesses. I mean, uh, what I try to do right now, but doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't apply, it must apply to all kinds of investing. I mean, if you think about it, a broad based index like the BSE 500 today represents 93% of India's market cap. 
So if you invest in the BC 500 index, you are buying almost everything, right? You're saying yes to almost everything. You're buying almost every, I mean, if you add up uh, the numbers, you are basically buying, uh, getting exposure to 93% of India's market cap. It means saying yes to almost everything. And index investing works, right? We know that. Um, there are certain limitations to it, but index investing has worked, hasn't it? So even in the field of investing, saying yes to almost everything has worked. But when it comes to investing in a business with a enduring competitive advantage, then it is almost, you know, a mathematical here, a, a theorem here that by definition, you can't have businesses with high quality. Most businesses cannot, cannot have everything can't be high quality, right? So uh, when you talk about quality, you are talking about quality on a dimension. There is there are weak businesses, there are um, mediocre businesses, and there are strong businesses, and there are extraordinarily strong businesses. You want to be on the right side of the spectrum, not the left side of the spectrum. And what that means is that you need to have filters. You need to have quantitative filters and qualitative filters, and you need to be able to understand that almost everything out there is not going to um, uh, you know, uh, um, pass the quality checks that you have in mind, um, which means that you need to say no to almost everything, which means you need to have filters for quickly rejecting literally thousands of ideas out there. So in that context and in that context alone, when it comes to investing, I think uh, the, the quote is applicable. So again, coming back to the point, context matters. Thank you so much. So moving on to the next question. Uh, don't ignore base rates has been one of your recurrent themes in investing, which is visible in your blog posts, interviews, and also tweets. Any particular investing example in today's time you would like to use to further expand on this theme? Yeah, I mean, it's a favorite topic of mine, but again, I think it's a lot misunderstood quite a lot. So I'll make some clarifications here. So what is the meaning of base rates? Is basically looking at historical situations which are similar to the situation that you are examining and there are many ways of classifying similar situations so for example if you are buying uh, into an ipo stock um, then you can think about well what happened in previous ipos so there's a similarity over there or if you are buying into uh, businesses uh, at very high p multiples you can go and figure out what is the averaged out experience of people who buy high p multiple stocks over a long period of time or if you are investing in businesses with weak balance sheets, and uh, you can figure out uh, what is the average out experience of uh, people putting money in businesses with weak balance sheet. What happens when economic shocks happen? What happens when the economy is booming and what happens when the economy is in recession? What happens when there is a external shock to the economy like COVID happened recently and so on. Uh, similarly, you can think about the base rates of what happens to people who invest in promotional companies where the insiders are trying to uh, prom over promote their businesses because they want to eff effectively make money off investors. Uh, and then you can also think about base rates of investing in certain industries. You know, what is the average out experience of investing in retail businesses or the airline businesses? or investing in serial acquirers, businesses which tend to grow inorganically. What is the average dot experience? And if you do that calculation, historically, if you do analysis, you will find that base rates really suck in most of these situations. The average dot experience is not good. But that's where the problem begins, because that's the definition of base rate. That only tells you about the probability, right? Base rates only tell you about Probability of success based on past evidence. Now, there is a style of investing where the probability of success may be low, but the consequences of success, if that event occurs, if success occurs, is extraordinarily high. And so on an expected value basis, it may turn out to be a good bet. So a system which has lots of bets with a high probability of failure, where one loses anywhere between 50 to 100% of capital, can still make economic sense if there were just a few bets that will make 10x. So if you're investing in such a system like venture capitalists do all the time, you are not walking away from situations where probability of success is very low. Actually, you like those situations because you want exposure to uncertainty because some of these ideas could turn out to be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, 1000x ideas. 
and you don't need a lot of those ideas. So there are this asymmetric payoffs in equity investing. The max that you can lose in an unlevered position is 100% of your capital. The max that you can make, there is no limit to that, right? So that mathematical asymmetry uh, makes, li uh, makes life very interesting for an investor uh, who is uh, thinking in terms of probabilities and consequences instead of only thinking about probabilities. So rather, you know, you tend to acknowledge it explicitly by having a highly diversified portfolio uh, like venture capitalists too. You just try to get lucky in a few bets because the profit on those few lucky ones can more than offset all the losses of the losing bet. Now, this is not what I do. This is not what I teach, but I don't want to say that that's not the right way to think. Um, but I think the real meaning of don't ignore base rates should is better understood when you think about uh, the idea of Bayesian reasoning. And I've done some lectures on that subject. So when you do Bayesian reasoning, there is this initial hypothesis that you have, whatever idea that you have in mind, which is based on base rate, historical information, um, uh, and then there is information specific to the situation that you are trying to evaluate right now, that, that you're studying right now. Let's talk about an example. You know, you pick up a, pick an IPO. You know the base rates suck, but you know that this company has got certain characteristics which make you feel that uh, this is not like the average company out there. The average out experience is not the same as the experience of the exceptional. So you may come across a business in the airline industry, in the retail business, in highly levered businesses, in turnaround candidates, in serial acquirers, in IPOs and what have you, where the, even though the odds of success are low, but there are certain characteristics about the business that you are studying, which are very unique, which sort of perhaps dilute the base rate. And therefore what that means is that, well, yeah, you don't ignore the base rate, it's there. It's there in your mind. You know the odds are against you, but you also know that the consequences of success, if this thing works out in a, in a tough industry, could be dramatic. So it would be extremely tough industry, could be airline, could be uh, retail, could be you know, investing in uh, even high P multiple stocks, could be investing in uh, serial acquirers. Not all serial acquirers uh, destroy value. Most do, but that doesn't mean all do. So the question then becomes as to, you know, how do you balance these two things? And um, so you have to think about base rates. You have to think about uh, the evidence uh, specific to the situation that you are studying. And this is where the problem arises actually from a behavioral point of view, because when people study businesses and ideas, uh, they lose sight of the base rates. They only focus on the the unique characteristics of the businesses that they are evaluating right now. They don't think about how this particular situation or business is similar to similar situations in the past and how did, the, how did those fare? And then they don't ask the hard, uh, hard question as to why should this be different? Maybe it will be different, but you won't even know what questions to ask unless you compare them with a body of knowledge drawn from history about similar situations in the past. Maybe this IPO is different. Sure, that's fine. But you can't draw that conclusion by only looking at the prospectus of this particular company, by only looking at the, uh, uh, the presentation made by this company, by only looking at the literature circulated by the people who are running the issue, uh, or by doing some rudimentary search about the industry. You have to actually recognize that this is an IPO, what is an IPO? What really happens in IPOs? And what is the average order experience? And why should this be different? Um, maybe it will turn out to be different, but then you won't know that unless you compare it with uh, base. So ba basically, base rates moderate your enthusiasm about something. Uh, and that's the role that they play uh, when, when you say that don't ignore uh, base rates. Now, I want to add a couple of more points on this. 